I hope you can hear me and see me properly. Good afternoon to everyone. Welcome back to this new webinar in this energy data modeling program uh, by the International Energy Agency. This is webinar number 10. And as you know, we will have with us um, our partners from the Imperial College, which will be uh, presenting some of their perspectives um, and on how they apply uh, modeling in uh, real uh, case studies um, they do uh, around the world, but in particular um, in, uh, in, uh, in the African continent and also uh, I think in, uh, in Asia. So just uh, a quick recap uh, to contextualize this uh, within our agenda, overall agenda. As I said, this is um, webinar number, like it's number nine, no, but it's the 10th because we had uh, webinar zero. Uh, actually, we switched uh, the, this webinar with the Politecnico di Milano, another partner from Italy, which will be presenting Thursday because of um, unforeseen events. Um, then we, so uh, to, tomorrow we will have Politecnico di Milano joining us and the day after tomorrow we will have a dedicated webinar on SDG7 in which we will uh, focus on access to clean cooking and electricity and how we can model these two very important aspects. Uh, then next week we will basically finish this first phase of uh, this uh, webinar series um, with a specific webinar um, dedicated to solid biofuels estimation model. And then we will have a wrap up quiz and closing session in which we will ask you a few questions related to uh, all the topics we touched during um, this program. So I will leave the floor to uh, our partners from the Imperial College. Uh, I just remind you that if you have questions, feel free to write in the chat in the Q&A box or to raise your hand uh, so that we can give you the floor and so that you can unmute yourselves and uh, turn on your camera and directly ask for any question doubts you may have. So uh, I think now, Naomi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Darlene. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar. Our team at Imperial College are very excited to be here and thank you for inviting us to speak today. So we'll kick off this webinar with a quick round of introductions from ourselves. Um, so I'm Naomi Tan. I am a research assistant at Imperial College and also a PhD student at Loughborough University. And my PhD thesis looks into energy modeling, energy policy, and energy economics. And very happy to be here uh, speaking to you all. Um, on to the next one, Carla. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning. <laughs> I'm, I'm Carla Canone. I'm a PhD student at Loughborough University and research associate at Loughborough and Imperial College. And yeah, working with Naomi and Rudolf and, and Beth and others at CCG uh, in this uh, program called the Climate Compatible Growth uh, Program. And yeah, looking at the, the science policy uh, interface for uh, sustainable development. Uh, Rudolf and then Beth, over to you. Thanks. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure for me to be here. My name is Rudolf Yeganian. I'm a research assistant at Imperial College London, working for the Climate Compatible Growth Program. My focus is uh, modeling with osmosis and um, having um, capacity building events. And it's a pleasure for me to be here once more and I look forward to giving you a presentation. Over to Beth. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Beth Tennyson. So I'm associated not with Imperial, but actually I'm based in Cambridge, UK at the Center for Global Equality. Um, my role within the Climate Compatible Growth or CCG program is to build partnerships with people in our priority countries. So in my presentation, I'll take you through um, one of the networks that we've well established, which is in Kenya and also one network that we're starting in Zambia and just talk you through the process that we take um, when developing a, a strong and sustainable partnerships. Um, I'm very happy to be here, thank you. Cool, thanks everyone. And um, we'll start our webinar with um, our first session, which is uh, with Carla. 
and she will give you a quick run through of CCG and also um, a presentation of uh, raw data to investment process. So looking at starter data kits, which she developed, um, the summer school and also her methods X paper. Um, so on to you, Carla. Yeah, thanks. Just bear with me for a second. So I share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. All right. Okay. So before starting this presentation, I'll, I'll quickly give you an overall presentation of the of CCG program. So this is the Climate Compatible Growth Program and is funded by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development uh, Office, so the FCDO, and uh, to support investments in sustainable energy and transport systems so to meet the, uh, the development priorities in the Global South. Carla, we can't see presentation mode. We see we see session three in non-presentation mode. Oh, okay. One second. Mm. Can you see the presentation now? Um, no, it's no? non-presentation mode. I think if you go in the bottom right-hand corner, there should be a button for you to present in presentation mode. Give me a second. Oh yeah, that button would do. One second. Perfect. Yeah, now is it, is it in presentation mode? Yeah. All right. And you can see only the that, not the rest of my screen. No. <laughs> Good. Okay, so uh, uh, as I was saying, the climate compatible growth is funded by the UK government and we support investment in sustainable energy and transport system to meet the development priorities in the global south. So CCG provides research and global public goods, so accessible to everyone. And these are to our countries like Rwanda to develop economic strategies, plans, and policies to attract investment into low carbon uh, opportunities. Across multiple sectors, we don't look only at energy, but also at other sectors, and we we'll look at that in, in this presentation. Um, so what we want to do is that we want to support the aspiration of the country. So what each, each country wants to develop and because I guess that you you know way better how to develop your country that how will do mm -hmm. and to better meet the uh, sustainable development goals. So this program, as you heard, uh, we are from Imperial, Loughborough, Cambridge. So it brings together some of the UK leading research organization and partners them with local researcher, governments, uh, multinational banks, and international organization. So all these people uh, try to, to work together to find uh, the most suitable, suitable low carbon development pathways. So for example, we assess uh, the most fit for purpose policy, regulatory market models, and risk mitigation option uh, and implement them in, in the country. Uh, so the program, so CCG and its partners will develop um, and are developing right now a set of tools, model, and, and data set that are uh, offered to the public as a, as a public good. So they are free and accessible to, uh, to all. So um, that was a quick presentation over CCG and later on we'll hear from Beth, but also from Mark Howells, that is the director of the program, uh, a little bit more about what we do and in which way we engage uh, people in, in different countries. But uh, for the sake of my presentation now, I will uh, cover quickly the definition of the energy, of energy system, uh, the importance of energy planning to accelerate the low carbon transition. And then I will present you the modeling process that we follow at CCG to go from raw data to policy and investment. So let me see if you can see my, can you see my, Second slide, just to confirm. Um, no, it's still the first the title slide. Um, that's weird. Now? Yes, yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Sometimes this thing, the weird stuff. 
Anyway, so before jumping into what energy system modeling is, let's quickly recall how an energy system is structured. So energy systems are complex systems containing many components and interaction. Uh, the main components that you can see here also are fuel production, energy resources, energy conversion, energy transportation, and final demands for energy services. So energy resources include fossil fuels, such as coal or natural gas, alongside renewable energy resources, such as solar or wind energy. These resources often undergo conversion. Uh, for example, solar and wind energy uh, are converted to electricity, while crude oil is often converted to more useful uh, products like diesel. The products of this conversion then need to be transported to where they are used. So energy systems include a range of final demands and that can be divided by sector. For example, residential electricity, demand or demand for oil products in the transport, in the transport sector. So it's important to recognize that those demands are driven by us, so by the society of a specific country. And for example, we need electricity to do various things. And, and now we see even more like we are always connected to, to, to the internet and, and so on. So we have so, uh, so, different, uh, so many different demands in, in a country from lightning, heating, transport, um, and those are provided by fuels such as electricity or oil products. So once electricity has been generated, it is transported to the end user where it's used in a range of sectors. Now, quick recap of what an energy system is, but what do we do with this energy system? We model them. So what does that mean? So um, energy system modeling is the process of mathematically analyze an energy system using computer programs. And what do we want to do this for? To inform energy policy development in a comprehensive, transparent, and efficient and evidence-based manner. So essentially, energy system modeling uh, enables policymakers and energy analysts to better conduct energy planning activities. For example, what can we do is that we can simulate the energy system configuration under different scenarios and assess its properties, for example, so cost, environmental impacts, or flexibility. Energy modeling tools, therefore, provide a critical uh, analysis of both existing or future and alternative scenarios of the energy mix of your country. And it's important to remember that they cannot predict the future. We wish they could, but they cannot. So the only thing that energy models can do is to give insights uh, to do better policy aligned with this, this evidence. So indeed, energy planning is about finding trade-off solution and dealing with future uncertainties. For example, price and availability of primary resources, technology development, government's commitment, and growth of demand. And comprehensive energy planning is crucial because we ensure sustainable growth and we can play um, and it can play an essential role in informing uh, the decision makers in, in different ways. So let's let's move to the different step of the modeling exercise. So this diagram shows some of the most common steps of a modeling analysis. Uh, and in the next slide, we see exactly how we carry out this specific process, but in CCG. So the first stage is uh, usually sourcing the raw data. In this case, we see that it's written open data, and indeed that's what we, we use in, in at CCG as well. Um, so the data are open, accessible, transparent, and, and freely available. Uh, the raw data then have to be processed most of the time, which usually means that we need to manipulate them in a form that can be used for the model. Uh, this must include converting the units or the format in which the data arrive, or using the raw data to create estimates for some model parameters. Now, once the model, uh, once the data have been processed, the model can be formulated, and these steps vary depending on the tool that you decide to use. For example, uh, in CCG, one of the tools that we use is a spreadsheet-based interface uh, that can be used to input the data for an osmosis model, which is called ClickSan. Uh, but I guess Rudolf will cover that later on uh, in this session. 
The model then has to be solved. And in this, in the case of optimization model, uh, this involves using a solver on your computer that can find the optimal solution. So let's say the cheapest option, depending on the constraint that you put in. So once the solution has been found, it has to be interpreted in, in the context of your, the country. So, and it's important to take in consideration all the assumptions that have been made in terms of um, constraints, but also on the data and simplification that that uh, were done in the modeling process. Um, so now let's see how do we do this in at CCG specifically. But first, let's. I want to bring your attention to this this quote. So uh, before jumping into this process from raw data to policy and investment, uh, so. This, this sentence give us a little bit of context of what we do. So the dialogue has shift from viewing climate change as a risk to seeing the opportunity and really translating that into a single objective, which is to move our economies to net zero as quickly as possible. That's a tremendously exciting development because what we have now in private finance is a focus on a clear goal, net zero, and finding the opportunity to advance that and to be rewarded by it. Let's give a little bit of, of a context if it's not net zero like tomorrow, but is also a, a, a way and um, the aim now has changed to move to a low carbon uh, economy. So every country will have different objective and different uh, level of ambition um, regarding this, this objective. So uh, let's see how do we reach that? This is our process is with, with this uh, infographic that summarize a little bit this, the steps. Uh, so we take uh, raw data from publicly available sources and create um, open source databases that can be used as a starting point for the, um, for the energy models. So if you follow from, from one to five, uh, we can see that indeed through our nodal novel data pipeline process, and we are at point two, uh, what we do, we, we are able to manipulate in an automatic way, uh, raw data coming from multiple sources. We, we, we made up a recipe to take all these data that come from different sources and uh, translate them and into a single uh, format that is useful for the, uh, for the model. Uh, so it's a consistent format uh, compatible with, with osmosis or other, or other tools. So the result is step three, which is made of the starter data kits. Uh, this is a collection of open source and tool agnostic data repositories. And it's currently available for 69 countries and it helps uh, energy analysts and academics to get started quickly uh, with the energy modeling analysis. Instead of collecting all the data, losing a lot of time and a lot of money uh, to collect this data, those data are uh, made, uh, are available uh, as a public good um, as thanks to this work that, that, that we did this so you can you can find them online and download for for your exercise you're free then to use our tool or to use other other tools uh, so we don't want to lock people into what what we propose but well if you decide to use one of our seven tools that's where we get to point number four that is application and analysis um, and you can see that here we have um, is is the moment in which we have to to do the, the, the modeling work. So we take the data, we put them in the model, we run this model, and then we produce some, uh, some hopefully useful uh, results. And so the, what we have here is that uh, those seven uh, tools, and I will cover them uh, later on, and Rudolf will give you a detailed explanation of what each of them can do, what are the benefits and limitations. Um, so then to, to learn how to use this, we have self-taught and certified online teaching material that we developed together with the Open uh, University uh, and support online, the troubleshooting support that you see there to support you while you uh, you learn um, those, those skills. Uh, so then to deepen the modeling skill, we are organizing partners in partnership with the international organization, capacity building training around the world. And we're still at point number four. And all of these steps lead to the end goal of influencing the policy process and mobilizing investment into low carbon solution. So now let's quickly look at each of these steps. And, and then uh, I guess you will have more info of each tool uh, later on. But 
first the data pipelines uh, so this is another process that we established uh, a ccg that feed raw data into a single data collection and manipulation tool this allows for data creation in a consistent format ready for a modeling analysis using one of the uh, available tools the process to create an energy system model now can be done Piece for free and with minimal modeling expertise, but also it allows you to save a lot of time um, while you have to compile an energy model because you have to find all the different data from different sources in a different format. So by using this, you can you can do it way quicker. Um, so you can access the preprint uh, paper clicking on on the link that is here on the slides, but. Uh, I've, I'll share that in, in the chat later on, uh, and here you find like a suggestion of how this could be done. Next, the start of data kits. So uh, right now they are available for 69 countries, including all mainland Africa, and they overcome the barrier of data inaccessibility. Each start of data kit has a preprint article on Research Square, data sets on Zenodo, and ready to be run model files uh, using clicks and interface for osmosis but again we'll we'll talk about this uh, later on and uh, recently a combined paper on the start data kits has been published by data and brief on Elsevier uh, so also here you have um, all the links uh, needed so if you want to access a start kit for, for Rwanda you can either go on the CCG website and, and click on the map and you'll get the link for uh, for Zenodo and the preprint paper, and then the, the the paper, the combined paper is up there, at least on my screen, up there uh, in in yellow. Finally, uh, how to get started with our tools? Okay, now all great, but how do I do I start? How do I learn uh, the basic skills? So uh, I would suggest to take one of the Open Learn online courses. So this collection that we have online was developed by a set of important UN and international organization, uh, together with CCG and other leading university in this field. So the courses focus on simple tools uh, used to develop energy balances, energy projection, energy investment, emission and renewable integration modeling, uh, integrated climate, land, water modeling, system of system modeling, and basic energy infrastructure, infrastructure financing. There will be another presentation later that will cover the benefits and potential application of each of these tools. These courses and the tools that they use are free to everyone, to all, and we invite you to join us to develop capacity for better evidence-based policy making with analysts and academics from across the world. I have to say that there's quite a, a big community that is, is growing, in particular in, in Africa, that is, is using those tools. So uh, pl please join us because yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fine space and a pretty active uh, space right now. Uh, so the tools are open source and have been developed by forward-looking organizations who know the importance of community accessibility, continuous improvement and accountability. So the courses are designed to be self-taught, so a step-by-step -step guide is provided through a combination of theoretical classes and hands-on exercises. So basically you will learn some concept and then right after you will have to apply them uh, using the tool that you selected. At the end of the course, you get a certificate if you complete all the quizzes and hands-on. And this certificate is currently the prerequisites to be admitted to one of our capacity building uh, training. Uh, so yeah, so right now we have the application are open for those capacity building events and people have to first complete one of those courses and to then be able to submit their application. So to close up, oh sorry, to close up with my presentation, the capacity building event. So CCG supports the organization of international capacity building events in partnership with international organization and other institution. In each of these events, we train up to 250 policy uh, professional, mostly government analysts and academics on how to utilize the tools uh, provided in the Open Learn collection. The trainings are three weeks uh, long each and participants gain a certificate at the end from international organization that, that 
that work with us. Um, participants reported 98 satisfaction rate in the past, and all of them suggested that they would um, yeah, recommend that to a colleague. So if you know uh, about this, this training or you want to attend, yeah, please visit the, the ICTV website and you can apply um, to the next upcoming event that is the online uh, joint summer school on modeling tools for sustainable development long name to say that the the application closed on the 1st of may so we really look forward to to receiving your um, your application and to yeah train you again uh, we have trained for seven uh, tools and so you, the one of the open university um and yeah, you will get in-depth training from experts in, in this field and uh, leading experts in, in this field so you can develop your case study and uh, work closely with them to uh, put out some uh, some publication or some some work and analysis that can be used in your unit or in your uh, supporting your work uh, that you do every day basically so yeah uh, the link is there if you want to apply the indico ictp one and I guess that's the end of my presentation. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you at the ICTP and otherwise good luck with, with everything. Thank you, Naomi, over to you again. Thank you, Carla, for that great presentation. Um, now we'll move on to our quiz. So this quiz will be on um, climate change. And for this, you'll need your laptop or your phone. And I'll share my screen now so that you can log into the website and you'll need a simple code, which will be on the screen to log in. And once logged in, please type in your name and you can start. And we can start the quiz. So please join the quiz, go to slido.com, type in 971-437. And type your name in. Alternatively, you can also use your phone. Um, go to the, go on your camera app and scan the QR code that's um, in the top left-hand corner. So this will be a very simple quiz, nothing too hard, and um, the winner will win pride. <laughs> If people are troubled, please let us know to, to join. It's just a quick quick thing to not hear our voice all the time in these two hours. So it would be great if you could, could join us. Great, we've got Martin. Let's let's call some some names. I see Ale ah, and apologies. Yeah, that there is Christoph, Cornell, Fabrice, Irva, Innocent, Jean Bosco, Chandamour, P. Silas. Again, apologies for not pronouncing correctly your name. <laughs> We've got four people, five people now. That's great. Let's keep it coming. Joining is very simple. You can scan the QR code on the left or type in slido.com in your browser and type in 971437 as your code. Great. I think we'll wait for another minute before we kick off.
Right, okay, we've got nine. Is anyone else still struggling to log in? Give us a shout or raise your hand. Otherwise, we'll continue. We'll move on with the quiz. Cool. So I think we'll move on with the quiz. So let's start. First question, which country has emitted the most CO2 over time? So is that China, USA, Russia, or Saudi Arabia? I can see one person has answered two now. Four, keep it coming. One more person. Great. So all of you have answered, and most of you have said China, and um, some of you said USA. The correct answer is USA. So while China is currently the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, cumulative emissions are an important way to look at our overall contribution to global warming. So China's greenhouse gas emissions per year have only recently surpassed the US. Um, but over time, the US has emitted more CO2 than any other country to date, uh, more than twice the amount um, of China, which uh, is the world's second largest national contributor. So on to our next question. How long does CO2 remain in the atmosphere? CO2 washes out of the atmosphere seasonally. CO2 remains in the atmosphere for five to 10 years, or CO2 remains in the atmosphere for up to 200 years or more. Three more seconds. Cool. So most of you said CO2 remains in the atmosphere for up to 200 years or more, and that is the correct answer. So you can't put your finger on the exact lifespan of a CO2 in the atmosphere, but once it is added to the atmosphere, it can hang around for a long time. So as humans change the atmosphere by emitting carbon dioxide, those changes will endure on the time scale of many human lives. On to our next question. Oh, but before that, let's have a look at the leaderboard. So first place currently is Herwa, second for Braves, third Devota, fourth Cornell, and fifth Allen. And sorry if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing these names <laughs> absolutely um, atrociously, but um, don't worry, people who aren't in the, uh, the top five, you've got eight more questions to try and beat person, the person at the top. So let's move on quickly. Third question, how fast do we need to stop burning fossil fuels to limit global temperature rise to two degrees Celsius? Fifteen seconds to go. We've still got six people left to answer. Five seconds. Ah. So most of you said we need to start burning fossil fuels by 2040, and that is the right answer. So if we intend to minimize dramatic effects of Earth's climate system, we need to face this challenge to overhaul the world's energy use within just a few years. 
On to the next question, question number four, which form of energy is currently causing the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions globally? Is that natural gas, coal, oil, or nuclear? Twenty seconds. Five seconds. All right. Most of you said oil. The correct answer is coal. Coal is um, causes the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Now let's move on to our next question. So far, most of the strongest impacts of climate change have been observed in northern latitudes, southern latitudes, the tropics, or all added latitudes equally. Fifteen seconds to go. Five seconds. Most of you said northern latitudes, and that is the right answer. So the impact of global warming has become obvious in the high latitude regions. So this includes Alaska, Siberia, and the Arctic, where melting ice and softening tundra are causing profound changes. Let's look at the leaderboard. So the leaderboard has changed. Fabrice is now number one, top, top of the group. Don't worry, there are five more questions for all of you to beat him. On to, on to the next question. What percentage of Earth's atmosphere is comprised of CO2? Fifteen seconds to go. Five seconds. Most of you said zero point zero four percent, and that is the correct answer. So about ninety nine percent of the atmosphere is made of oxygen and nitrogen, and of the remaining one percent, one percent, the main molecules are CO two and water vapor. Leaderboard again, still the same. We've got four more questions to go. Anything can happen. Seventh question, which of the following places has warmed the most over the past hundred years? Four cities to choose from all in different regions. Fifteen seconds to go. Most of you said a Marrakesh in Morocco. The correct answer is a um, Norway, Svalbard in Norway. Um, the world has warmed about 1.2 degrees Celsius on average, but regions closest to the poles are warming much faster than tropical regions. So this town in Norway has warmed 2.7 degrees Celsius. And this is greater than the other cities mentioned here. So compared to Marrakesh, that's 1.7 degrees Celsius, Vancouver, one degree Celsius, and Basra, 1.8 degrees Celsius. On to the next question. 
If you removed the atmosphere's natural greenhouse effect and everything else stayed the same, Earth's temperature would be warmer or cooler? Fifteen seconds to go. Only one person has answered. Come on, guys. Five more seconds to go. Most of, well, equal split. So um, there's an equal split between 17 to 22 degrees Celsius warmer and 6 to 11 degrees Celsius cooler. And the answer is actually 28 to 33 degrees Celsius cooler. So the greenhouse effect traps heat, making earth warm. Without it, earth will be very, very cold and animals and plants would die and there would be no life on earth. Question number nine. What is the main challenge that greater mass production of solar panels faces? Four different options to choose from. Fifteen seconds to go. Five seconds to go. Most of you said scarcity of rare metals needed for the production of solar panels, and that is correct. So thin, cheap solar panels need tellurium, which is a mineral, and makes up 0.000001, a very, very, very small amount, so 0.00001% of the Earth's crust, making it three times rarer than gold. Um, and high-performance batteries need lithium, which is only easily extracted by um, briny pools in the Andes and platinum needed as a catalyst in fuel cells that turn hydrogen into energy comes almost exclusively from South Africa. Now, moving on to our last question. Ooh, before that, we have a leaderboard before our last question. Ooh, Fabrice is still at the top, but this last question could change everything, guys. Give it, all, give it your all. Question number 10, what are the main problems associated with hydropower plants? Fifteen seconds to go. Only four people have answered. Come on, five seconds. Sorry, ten seconds. Now five seconds. Last question. Most of you said costs. The answer is building spot site specificity. Um, so building site is very important. So hydropower has the ability to generate electricity without emitting greenhouse gases. Um, however, it can also cause environmental and social threats such as damaged wildlife habitat, harmed water quality, um, obstructed fish migration and diminished recreational benefits of rivers. So finding a specific site to build your hydropower plant is very, very important and a main thing to consider. So that is our last question and congratulations for Breeze. You're number one, you're top of the league, but don't worry, we have another quiz later on in this webinar. 
um, more on energy modeling. So yeah, brush up your skills. You can always beat Fabrice in the next quiz. So I'll start sharing my screen now. And I hope you guys had fun with the quiz. I did. And we'll move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Beth. Um, and she will talk about current CCG engagement in country and ongoing activities. So on to you, Beth. OK, thanks, Nomi. And I was like shouting answers during the <laughs> But I didn't right. say it. <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, it actually is not letting me do that, which is weird. Hang on, maybe, hang on, maybe one second. Oh, okay. Can you see this okay? Yes. In presentation mode and everything? All good? Yeah. Okay. All good. Okay, great. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, and thanks for having um, me speak here today um, at the IEA discussion. Today, I wanted to just briefly mention the current CCG engagements that we're doing in country. So I think Carla did a great job of explaining the CCG program overall, in particular, the international engagement approach um, with, within modeling. Um, I'm going to discuss the other, another portion inside of CCG, which is the national partnership engagement. So uh, CCG has priority countries. And while we are engaged internationally in many countries around the world, um, there are a few countries where we focus on and we develop networks within. Um, and don't the, these are usually in places where there's high ambition and there's current um, need for CCG expertise more, um, more targeted. So I wanted to give an overview of the two of two of our countries, which is Zambia and Kenya, but a higher focus on Kenya. But first, I thought it might be useful to, to quickly go through our approach and then discuss the different activities. So I'm part of the National Partnership Team, as I mentioned before, which is based in Cambridge at the Center for Global Equality. Um, once a priority country is, has been identified, uh, typically what we do is a series of three activities in the beginning for short-term engagement. And then we build up this in order to build up strong long-term network engagement. So there's three things, stakeholder mapping. We need to decide who's doing what in terms of not only energy modeling, but CCG has broader expertise within transport and policy and, um, and also job creation and ec economics. So we do stakeholder mapping to see who's doing what, what's the current landscape within the country. Then we find and, and connect the expertise that CCG has, which I'll quickly go over, um, to the stakeholders that we've identified. And then the third and very important portion is to hire a country coordinator. So this is someone who will be on the ground based in our country that's going to help um, make sure that these the collaborations are delivered. So then we move into the co-creation phase um, or phase two of our approach, which is the probably the most important port, part of the entire engagement, where we really hope to, to make partnerships where we, our expertise can be useful and it's uh, demand led. We're not trying to come in with CCG expertise only and deliver things that we want to deliver, but we're more about creating projects together um, where we can be useful. So we form, and to do this, we form up special interest groups in the country. So there might be a topic that's highly relevant within Kenya, for example, and we have expertise to match that topic, and then we'll bring people together to begin forming up knowledge, maybe proposing projects together, things like this, to make a community of experts around that interest group. And then we, begin the co-design and co-creation of projects. And finally, we would share those outputs and, and, and continue working on maybe further ones in the future. And then the third phase would be dissemination and monitoring and evaluating what, how the perception of that work has been, has been going. 
And then this would be a feedback loop. So we would continue to go back to the drawing board and co-design projects. Um, one of the biggest things within the network is we're hoping that ownership is taken from um, our, our in-country partners. And eventually CCG's biggest success, particularly from the national partnership side, would be to leave a country and all of this activity is still going even without us but our knowledge was, has been incorporated in the development projects. So that would be our, our big success. The expertise within CCG, um, I'll just quickly go through the different, so system design is what we've been hearing through a lot, um, which is the energy modeling, systems modeling, uh, which is led by Adam Hawks at Imperial, and then Steve Pye at UCL, and then Mark Howells, who you'll hear from later, um, and Steffi Hermer, who does the GIS modeling, so the geospatial modeling. We also have sector interactions. So these are um, resilient, climate resilient infrastructure by J Jim Hall in Oxford. And then uh, sector emissions, different carbon emissions in different sectors. And how, if you had a project that could be funded, what's the embodied carbon of that project, even along the supply chain? Um, so if you wanted a wind farm, how much carbon is embodied within that wind farm, for example. And then finally, the policies, economics and policies. So we have experts in economics, such as Sam, who's also at Oxford. Um, Julie Tomea at UCL is a policy expert looking at climate compatible growth, particular uh, policies. We have investment pipeline, that's Alex Money uh, at Oxford. And then finally, electrification of transport. So that's where uh, CCG's expertise comes in. Now, let me go through the different networks. We've just had our Zambia CCG network, who, which has just started. Um, we had an inception work, workshop last month, and this project, this network is in phase one. We've currently done the stakeholder mapping, which is who attended the, the workshop, and we've brought in certain CCG expertise. However, we have not yet identified a partner who will help coordinate the activities. So we're still in phase one in Zambia, but it was really useful to hear what the demand was. And we're still trying to identify how CCG will further engage, but there's a few avenues that we've foreseen. And that was a really great event. Um, the second, which is a network that we've actually partnered with and we've been working in Kenya since the last year. Um, and last month, we also had our Kenya CCG annual workshop we partnered with Strathmore University in Kenya for this. And this is in phase two. There's quite a few projects ongoing in Kenya already, which I'll go over. And uh, it's been quite a great, it was great to meet with uh, our network for the first time in person in the last year. So just quickly, some examples of network activity um, is the system design workstream that I discussed. They're working with the Ministry of Energy to do national energy planning. This project has further led to us um, having a project about linking the county and national energy planning teams. So Steffi and the geospatial modeling team is good at energy planning at the county level. And we're trying to link up the system design with a national level that we already have ongoing in the modeling. So that's been really exciting and fruitful and quite relevant to this group. Um, as well as you want to become modeling and energy planning experts. In our economics and policies uh, experts, we're doing different policy pathway special interest groups. We have um, a Katui County case study looking at political economy of that county and how decisions on energy gets made. And then also a political economy towards a just transition um, in CCG for for Kenya specifically, again, looking at what the different policy landscape is and how enabling that might be for certain energy, um, certain energy decisions to be made. And then in our carbon, uh, or sorry, in our transport experts, they have a special interest group, which is looking at how to link electromobility and renewable energy um, integration. And they've also put together a database which has all of the transport data in one place that's freely available. And I should caveat this by saying all of the um, activities we really strive to follow in an open data, open source, um, and very collaborative spirit. So as, as so that other people can use and share this knowledge quite easily. Um, and with that, I will end there. 
I want to thank you all for your attention. And just to show you that while I showed you and highlighted on Kenya and Zambia, we also work in Laos and Vietnam. And if you do have any further questions and want to know more about our network and our process, um, please do email me. My email is there and I can also put it in the chat for you. But let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Beth. Great presentation. Um, and now we'll move on to our next speaker, Rudolf. Um, Rudolf will be talking to us about the CCG energy modeling tools, uh, their benefits and their applications. It's on to you, Rudolf. Thank you, Naomi. Let me just share my screen quickly. Um, right. So when I put this, can you see it full screen now or? Yes, it's a presentation mode now. Okay, perfect. Cool. So I'll be talking to you today about um, energy modeling tools. And these are the tools that are developed by CCG and partners. So it's a number of tools that I'll be going through. and. Um, I will begin just in a second, excuse me for this. Right, so the tools I'll be talking to you about are the following that are displayed on the screen. So there is EBS and MITE, Onset, Osmosis and Flex Tool, Muse, FinPlan, Clues, and Nismod. So these tools are developed by the following partners. So some of them are developed by specific international organizations and others in cooperation with one another. First off, I'll be talking to you about EBS and MIDE. So this is developed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Now EBS is a tool for understanding what data is needed and what is not for energy balance formulation. Um, and essentially the idea of ABS is to identify relevant missing data, structure the data and mapping the flows of energy um, products from supply and conversion to final consumption for a given year, forming a framework for obtaining and creating energy balance and energy uh, generation data. And um, lastly, building country specific data sets and not relying on international data. The next tool that I'll be talking to you about is MIAD. So MIAD is somewhat, you can view it as an extension of EBS. So if you were to formulate your data balance sheets using EBS, then you would all move on to MIAD to conduct some scenario analysis. And what MIAD does essentially, it uses a simulation approach in order to be able to depict um, demand, scenario and demand scenarios for a given country. So the methodology used is a scenario one uh, based on bottom up disaggregated data energy use. What this means is that energy use is split up by different types of energy use and sectors. So let's say, for example, for transport, it would be between um, vehicles and ships, um, airplanes, different types of vehicles, EVs, and so forth. Same would go for, for example, for um, household section. So let's say if it's going to be um, demand for household electricity would be cooking, heating, lighting, so on and so forth. The scenario approach uh, within Maya helps us to make conditional assumptions about the future state of the country. So depending on how a scenario is developed, you can somewhat have certain assumptions upon which you can see what sort of a demand projection could be done. It is suitable for modeling the impact of alternative policies for energy use. Um, and MIAD also allows you to evaluate the impact of technological development. MIAD can be used to model the effect of changes in lifestyle of society. So in terms of the questions that these two tools help to answer, EBS answers the following question. What data do I need to create a standardized energy balance sheet? And how can I build a country-specific data set? MIAD on the other hand, on the other hand, answers what could energy demand in country X look like over the years? And if I change Y variable, how would energy demand in the future change? Right, over to onset. So EBS uh, was very much about formulating the correct data for a country. Mayad was very much about looking at demand projections of a country. Onset, on the other hand, is a geographical information system-based tool for developing 
electrification investment scenarios. So what Onset does essentially is it enables one to be able to map out how grids within a country could work in order to ensure supply and demand are met and develop scenarios of this of different costs and different types of grid connections. So essentially it identifies a least cost plan for universal electrification through a mix of grid network extension, mini grid systems and standalone systems. It also incorporates in a specially explicit manner resources, infrastructure, technologies and demand. So just to give you an idea, this is the sort of analysis that Onset can do. So in this case, it is Kenya and um, on both on the left and on the right, you can see the different aspects of the scenario. Essentially, this shows the electrification pathways that Kenya could achieve, whether this, is, this ensures that supply and demand are met and what other approaches could be taken. In terms of the questions that Onset answers, Onset answers, how can country X be electrified in terms of ensuring that there is enough grid connections to supply electricity to all households? And it can answer the question of what different scenarios are there for electrifying country Y? How do these compare to one another? Right, now over to Osmosis and Flex tool. So suppose you don't wanna look at just um, electrical grids of a country, you want to look at the energy system as a whole. So you wanna conduct whole scale energy system analysis. This will bring you over to Osmosis. Osmosis is a least cost optimization model designed to um, create a pathway for meeting energy demand from a given set of technologies. It is built in standalone blocks and these blocks are the ones that you can see on the screen. So Osmosis is capable of incorporating all these aspects of an energy system and these all can be constrained to look at specific scenarios. To put simply what Osmosis does is it defines existing technologies and new options. So let's say if, if in a certain country there exists a nuclear power plant, three hydro stations and a coal power plant. So you can define those as energy producing power plants in a country and you can define new options. So you could say, for example, solar power plants, uh, wind farms, um, and let's say uh, geothermal plants. What then Osmosis does is it takes a predefined demand. So this is a demand that you've given the model. You could have done this using MID, for example, and it calculates what's the most cost efficient manner of meeting that demand given the technologies that exist in the country and could exist. On top of that, what you can do is you can apply specific policy constraints to see how the model will find the cheapest options of meeting a demand given the constraints. So for example, let's say if I wanted to model um, a 2050 net zero scenario for um, Ghana, for example, right? What it would do is it would take the technologies over there and it would ensure that whatever mix is ended up in the energy system, so that's the technology mix, it does not produce carbon dioxide after 2050. Osmosis is Excel-based, meaning, um, and because it's Excel-based, it increases the accessibility of the tool. So you don't need to know any Python or anything like that in order to build a model using Osmosis. Essentially, it's a giant spreadsheet where data is filled and it is available on both Mac and Windows. There's also an online version called Osmosis Cloud. And just for your idea, this is, what um, the Excel spreadsheet looks like. So it's, it's a bunch of variables and you fill in data for the different years. As you can see on the right, it goes from 2015 all the way up to 2070. And over here on the left, you would choose a parameter and then define um, data for it. So just to give you an example of what Osmosis can do, this is a least cost scenario for Armenia. Over here, the dark blue is a nuclear power plant. The red is um, gas-fired power plants and the light blue are hydro stations. So these are the existing technologies. Now, as you can see, as demand grows, some of the technologies go out of operation. So the nuclear power plant disappears because it expires and gas capacity begins to decrease. Now, given no constraints to the model at all, this uh, model finds it the scenario finds that the cheapest way of replacing the dying out technology is investing in gray and gray is new gas technology. So suppose you did some osmosis analysis and you came up with a scenario just like the one I showed you, right? 
whether that's actually feasible in practice. So technically speaking, whether does that actually manage to meet supply and demand, ensure there is no curtailment and other such factors, this is when you would use FlexTool. So what FlexTool does is it takes either a scenario developed from an energy model like osmosis or a real life scenario, and it assesses the flexibility of such a system to function in practice, right? It does so in terms of loss of load, balance in the energy system and sector coupling. So it essentially tells you, right, if I was to actually gonna build such a scenario, such an energy system in my country, would this work or would it not work? And FlexTool also gives you ways of making a system work or make it better and um, to see what are the problems of a system not working. In terms of the questions that Osmosis and FlexTool answer, so Osmosis answers, what is the cheapest way of meeting country excess energy demand given certain constraints? And how do different long-term energy systems compare to each other? FlexTool answers, could energy system scenarios function in practice? Are they flexible enough? If not, how can such scenarios be improved? Right, over to Muse. Muse is very similar to Osmosis in the sense that it is a long-term energy system planning model. The difference is, is that it uses a novel agent-based methodology to closely simulate the development of energy systems by allowing the analysis and comparison of different scenarios. So what it does is it takes real investors, maps them out well into the um, energy system and sees from an agent perspective how an energy system can function in the long term. So how does it work when you can actually, uh, let's say, model business as well and investor behavior into a practical functioning of an energy system. But essentially, it is very similar to osmosis, just from a different approach. Osmosis takes, let's say, a much more aggregated look. Muse takes a much more specified look from the agent-based perspective. What is Muse used for? So it answers the question of what type of investments could be made to create a long-term energy system scenario, and how do different how do different uh, long-term energy systems compare to each, to each other? All right, now let's assume that you did some osmosis or MUSE analysis for your country, and the indications of the models are that you should build a nuclear power plant in your country. Let's just assume that. How could this be done practically? And when we say practically, in the end, we talk about finance. So how can, how was the financial, financial viability of such a project. What you can do is you can use FEMPLAN to assess that. FEMPLAN is an analytical and accounting tool to facilitate, facilitate financial analysis of power projects. FEMPLAN can design a financial package, evaluate alternative financing options, um, check fiscal incentives or disincentives, and analyze uncertainties. So this is a tool developed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And the whole idea behind it is to say, Right. If there's a power plant project that I have in hand, how can I assess its viability? How can I design some sort of a package towards it? There's certain things that FinPlan can do and certain things that it cannot do. So FinPlan may help to answer equity needed to have an appropriate leverage, return shareholders may expect, price of power to provide a minimum return to the shareholders, sensitivity of the project to exchange rates. FinPlan cannot take into account seasonal factors. It does not change a poor economic project into a successful one, and it cannot predict price of power or rate of interest. So it's more of an accounting um, model, and the whole purpose of it is just to account for a power plant project. Right, now let's say that we've also done the power plant project, and now we have an idea of what we want to do, but we haven't taken into account the resources of a country. This, is, this uh, step will bring us to the CLUES methodology. Now, CLUES itself is not a tool. It is a system. It's a methodology for analyzing both resources and other such factors in a country. Put simple, it's the climate, land, energy, and water system. And it's, it has, it's a tool for, uh, well, a methodology for integrated assessment of resource systems. It provides a means to simultaneously address matters of pertaining to food, energy, and water security. It explores how the manner and the extent to which we use these resources contribute to climate change. And it helps explore the vulnerability of the systems to changes in climate. 
for you to understand how clues works, you it's probably easier to understand it from a diagram like this. So starting from primary energy sources, let's say there's a coal mine, gas field, water source, land use, right? So these are resources of country X. These are used, um, well, transformed first of all, and then are used at certain places for certain things. So coal gets transformed and is used in coal power plant to produce electricity. Natural gas, same. Water, however, is used both to produce treated water, so drinking water, but at the same time, it's used in gas power plants, coal power plants, and maize farming. So what Clues does is it says, given your water supply, how much of this, and given the fact that some of it is used for drinking water, can you use for coal power plants, for gas power plants? It looks at scenarios for ensuring that your resource use is balanced and that there is no excess or under resource use. Same goes for land. So for example, land could be used for maize farming, but at the same time, it could be used for building large solar power plants. Clues essentially senses how much of that land can be used. What are the different scenarios? If I produce, if I use 50% of my land for um, solar uh, farms, then is it feasible to use the rest for maize farming, for example, given what the nexus and other such things. In terms of the questions that Clues helps answer, it answers how can resources of country X be used most efficiently to meet different aspects of energy demand and how do different scenarios of resource use compare to each other. And finally, there is a tool called NISMOD within the CCG toolkit. So NISMOD is a tool for analyzing and planning national infrastructure. Essentially, when building an energy system, one thing that needs to be considered besides just the grid networks that Onset can help to analyze is the actual infrastructure available in the country to support energy um, production, transportation, and use. And not just energy, but just the general infrastructure of a country. And this mode can be used for that. So it allows the evaluation of current infrastructure performance, risks, interdependencies, different infrastructure development strategies, and that's the key point of this mode essentially, outcomes and the best way forward. So essentially it allows you to build certain scenarios, look at different ways infrastructure can be structured in a country and compare these to one another to meet the goals that you wanna meet within your country. Now, just to give you a rough comparison between all the tools, essentially the comparison can be split up in three categories. So that's scope, focus and output. In terms of scope, most countries are on a, ra a rather large scale, so going to global country and city region, besides um, FEMPLAN. FEMPLAN is the only one that is a project level um, tool. In terms of focus, um, most of the tools focus on at least two things between energy, infrastructure, and resource. The only anomalies per se are EBS and MIAD, whose focus is primarily on energy and NISMOD, whose focus is primarily on infrastructure. And in terms of the type of output that you can expect from these tools, most of them offer both scenarios and assessment of these scenarios, with a few exceptions in terms of MULES, ONSET, and CLUES. These are the references that we used in this um, talk. And thank you for listening. And for any information on tools, you can find them on the link over here or using the QR code underneath. That takes you to the Open Learn course where you can find out more details and learn some of the tools if you wish to. Naomi, do we have time for some questions if there are any? Yes. Yeah, so um, thanks, Rudolf, for your, for your really good presentation. Very well explained. Uh, we do have one question from Devotha. Can you go back to EBS and explain briefly how the tool is used? Yeah. So let me just go right all the way back. Sorry, this is quite slow. Uh, come on, keep going. Almost there. All right, EBS. Okay, so what EBS is, it's, um, it's a tool in which there is the structure needed in order to come up with an energy balance, right? So the way an energy balance is usually structured is that on the top part of it, you have the, let's say the primary source or let's say fuels that are coming into a country. 
Then the second stage is the transformation and the third stage is the end use, right? So you would have, for example, I don't know, let's say uh, brown coal, for example, right? That's, that would come in that first and you would measure the total amount of energy that it is the, in terms of energy, some sort of an energy unit. So it's usually an SI unit. You'd measure the amount that has come in. Then that gets transformed and then that gets used um, in a coal power plant and produces electricity for industry, for example, right? So the way EBS works is that there's a list of all these different types of commodities, right? And you would go on specifying from one point to the other how much there has been put into the country. And then the, the tool automatically on its own creates this balance sheet, right? So some commodities are relevant for certain countries, others are not. For example, in the case of Armenia, um, fuel, uh, uh, sorry, oil in terms of electricity production is not used, right? So it's, it would be useless to include that in the in a energy balance for electricity um, there. And the idea is essentially just finding out the data, having the raw data within you and putting it into the EBS tool, which it literally just goes in a case of you taking a commodity, giving the data of it. And then that creates the energy balance that you need in the end. Now, what it also does is it shows whether your energy balance makes sense. Because, for example, you could have, I'm going to talk in petajoules, right? Let's say for some reason you have a yearly two petajoules of natural gas import into a country, right? But then down the chain of transformation of natural gas into, let's say, electricity and industry use, it could be the case that there is a mismatch between that in terms of the amount of natural gas that you import and uh, the amount that is actually being, the electricity that is being produced from natural gas is higher, right? And that leads to a mismatch. How could that be possible? So the tool is also effective for identifying things such as, firstly, data anomalies, secondly, black markets, and thirdly, just general functionings of the system to see whether everything fits accurately or doesn't. Essentially, it's that it's it's quite it's quite a simple tool. There is it's not very complicated in the way one would use it. It's more the case that it just helps you to take unorganized data and organize it in a very usable format. The way one would organize um, the data from EBS would be from the UNSD. So there's the uh, yearly questionnaire that comes up in uh, UNSD. I think I'm remembering the name correctly. And you could take the data from there, input it into EBS, and that would result in a balance sheet. And that balance sheet is then used for further analysis. I hope that answers your question. If you have a specific one, you can ask another one by all means. So I think that is our question. I think there's another... It's another one, but I think it might be directed at IEA. So Darlan, that's for you. Yeah, I saw, I saw the question. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, this, that can be definitely, uh, let's say, addressed as a question. Like right now, I couldn't, um, let's say, um, couldn't answer directly to this question. But since, as I introduced previously, uh, this is just phase one of our uh, training program, uh, we can definitely think about incorporating, I think, uh, these tools uh, in phase two. So if you want to uh, give us feedback, for example, on which of these tools are, uh, let's say, more interesting from, for you, uh, specifically uh, when talking about uh, Rwanda in this case, and also maybe underlining uh, which is the institution you work for. Um, yeah, like peace, I know, uh, I know, uh, but also other, other peers the colleagues, um, we can definitely think about it. But maybe what I would suggest also is also to, to have a look at the uh, summer school, which were, was presented previously, maybe to start attending this and in a second phase, we can think about how to, to deal with this. But uh, definitely, I think that's, uh, that's something feasible. <clears throat> yeah, cool. Thank you, Darlene, and thank you, Rudolf. Um, Cool. So on to the next session, that is our next quiz. So this one will be on energy modeling. So get your phones ready. 
and I will share the code in a minute. Let me share my screen. So this is your time to beat the previous winner and get on top. So again, this quiz is a really simple quiz, nothing too hard, just more an energy modeling. And to join the quiz, same as before, go on to your browser, type in slido.com and type in the code 959. Four eight six. There's also the QR code in the top left corner. So you can just grab your phone, go on the camera setting and scan the code on your camera app and it should take you to the Slido quiz. Cool, so we've got two people. Three now, so I'm expecting 13 as we've got 13 participants. If you have any problems logging on to Slido, please give us a shout and we can help you log in. But otherwise it's fairly easy just go onto your browser, type in slido.com and type in the code 959486. Seven people so far. Come on guys. Again, if you're, if you're having problems logging in, please type in the chat or raise your hand. We've got nine people now. We had 11 before, so come on, let's, let's reach that target. Cool. So I'll wait for another minute and then we'll start our quiz. Now, I think there's a question in the chat how to join this quiz from Jovina. Um, let's see the chat. Um, so, to join the quiz, please go on to slido.com. So, type this in your browser. So, this could be um, Google Chrome or your Safari browser or your Mozilla Firefox browser, type in slido.com and at the top of the page, you'll see enter code. And this is the code you need to enter 959486. Carla, could you also share the, um, the link to the second quiz? Cause I think, I think you might have access to the second quiz as well. If you put that on the chat, Sure, give, give me a second. Cool. Cool, Jovine, you made it. Great, so now we've got 10, okay. I think we'll go ahead with the quiz. Don't wanna take up too much time. So we'll start. First question is, what is not a main barrier to energy planning? 
shortage of skilled human resources, availability of adequate models or adequate data. So what is not a main barrier to energy planning? We've got two answers so far out of the 10. 30 seconds to go. Less than 20 to go now. Five people have answered. 15 seconds to go. Come on. The faster you answer these questions, the more points you will get as well if, they're, if your answer is correct. Cool. So most recent availability of adequate models. And the answer is correct. Availability of adequate models. So the main barriers for developing countries are the lack of adequate data and a shortage of skilled human resources to perform the analysis. So because of that, investment decisions are often based on ill-informed policy targets. On to the next question. How can quantified models of complex systems help decision makers? Number one, predict the future. Two, mitigation of uncertainty. Three, telling decision makers exactly what should be done. So which one of these is the right answer? We've got 30 seconds to go. No one has answered just yet. I remember the faster you answer, the more points you'll get. So the more likely it is you'll be number one. Ten seconds to go. Right, most of you said telling decision makers exactly what should be done, but the correct answer is mitigation of uncertainty. So from a technical perspective, this will allow analysts to compare different system configurations without incurring the upfront cost of building them. So it enables the mitigation of uncertainty. And that is the correct answer. Now let's look at our leaderboard. First one, Fabrice, again, you're, you're winning, you're smashing everything, but we've got eight more questions to go, guys. So it could be anyone by the end of this quiz. Question number three, are energy models a completely accurate representation of reality? First one, yes, or second one, no? 50-50 chance. Only one person has answered so far. Four now, 30 seconds to go. Twenty seconds to go. We've still got three people to answer. Right, all of you have answered, so we'll move on. Right, everyone said no, and that is correct. So we'll move on to our next question. Which of these is an example of an application of energy modeling tools? So planning future power system investments based on predicted energy demands, or understanding the environmental implications of power system investments, or both. Fifteen seconds to go. Ten seconds to go. Waiting for one more person. Cool. We'll move on. So most of you said both of a, a both of the above, and that is the correct answer. So broadly speaking, energy system modeling allows a greater understanding of the interactions between energy access, resource use, and sustainable development. Looking at the leaderboard now, number one is peace. Ooh, we've got a new leader now. We've got six more questions to go, so don't worry, anyone can be on top. Next question, what, what is usually the source of the largest losses in the electricity system? Power distribution, 
power transmission, where thermal energy loss was in power plants. Six of you have answered. Ten more seconds to go, and we're still waiting for two more people to answer. Come on, one more person. All right, everyone has answered. Most of you said power distribution, but the answer is actually thermal energy losses in power plants. So the first source, the first source of losses is actually um, thermal energy losses, losses in the generation of electricity. So thermal electricity generation by power plants is not 100% efficient, and some of the primary energy put in is lost as heat, and this is usually the largest losses in the system. Next question. When the supply of a commodity exceeds demand, what usually happens to the price of the commodity? So this is question six out of our 10 questions. So the price stays the same, the price falls, the price rises. 30 seconds to go. Fifteen seconds to go. Still waiting for eight more uh, for two more people. One person now. Ten seconds to go. All right. Most of you said the price falls, and that is the correct answer. Well done, everyone. So let's look at the leaderboard now. Peace. You're still number one. Well done. We've still got three more questions to go. It's question seven. What is a key influence on future energy demands? Population growth, economic development, or both of the above? Twenty seconds to go. Nine people have answered. We're still waiting for one more. Three seconds to go. Right, everyone has answered. And uh, most of you said both of the above, which is correct. So. One of the key challenges in energy planning is that energy demand changes over time. So for example, due to population growth or the creation of new industries. In energy planning, it is important that we think about how energy demands are likely to change in the future. So this is often done using forecasts of energy demands, such as future projections. And future predictions are based on how energy demands have changed historically. On to our next question, question eight which processes are typically represented by primary energy supply technologies. First one, extraction, production, or importation of fuels such as coal or oil. Second, generation of electricity by power plants. And third, transmission and distribution of electricity. got 20 seconds to go and only one person has answered. Come on, three people now. Five seconds to go and we're still waiting for three more. Uh, cool, all 10 of you have answered and most of you said extraction, production or importation of fuel such as coal or oil and that is correct. So uh, primary, primary energy supply technologies typically represent one of two processes. So the domestic extraction of production of fuel. So for example, domestic coal production and the importation of fuel. So for example, coal imports. Okay, last look at the leaderboard for our final two questions. First place is now Hirwa. And second Fabrice, 
third, let's say Nguyuma, sort of pronounced that wrongly. Uh, fourth piece and fifth Martin. We've still got two more questions. Anyone can be on top. Let's go with it. So question number nine which typically occurs over longer distances and at higher voltages, power transmission or power distribution? So two choices here, 50-50. Eight people have answered. Still waiting for two more and we've got 20 seconds to go. Okay, all of you have answered, so we'll go straight to it. Power transmission, 100%, and that is correct. So on to our last question. And remember, the fastest person will have more points, will gain more points. Last question. How do the cost of grid extension and off-grid solutions vary by geographical location? We've got three choices here. Thirty seconds to go. Fifteen seconds to go. Five seconds to go. Ooh, so most of you said, as distance from the grid increases, off-grid solutions become more affordable relative to grid extension. And that is correct. So well done everyone for participating in this quiz and congratulations for Brees, so you made it back on top. Number one again, well done. And congratulations to our top five and also everyone who participated in this quiz. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun um, hosting the quiz and we'll, go back to our seminar, our webinar. So I'll stop sharing my screen. And our last session will be with Mark Howe. So Mark has just joined this webinar and he will give us um, an overall presentation of CCG and the research program. So on to you, Mark. Thanks very much, uh, Naomi, and thanks for that quiz. Although having a look at the score, it looked like the top three positions were tied with eight out of 10. So um, just it, congrats. Yeah, congrats to all. Yeah, it was the timing. The fastest person will get more points. Mm -hmm. All to do with speed. But yeah, <laughs> carry on. Uh, great. So um, thank you very much for uh, letting us uh, talk and, and uh, be with you to, today. This has been really, uh, really helpful and very, very useful. Um, I thought it would be really worthwhile if I just gave a short background and introduction to where CCG comes from. And a lot of that background is uh, related to um, my experience uh, over, over time. And so I'm going to just tell a little bit of a story about that. And, um, you know, apologies to one or two folk in this, uh, in this group, in particular the trainers who've heard this before. But um, I want, uh, want to say it's a privilege to be able to um, to connect. And as you've uh, no doubt gone through today and you're very aware of, you know, without access to uh, appropriate, affordable energy supplies, development is just not possible. And so being able to get that, uh, get those supplies there is just critical. And there are two really important bits to that. One is to be able to motivate to release the financing required to make those investments. And then the second bit is to ensure that the, uh, the information on which policy is based is coherent and sound and, and, and sensible as well. So there are these two pieces, the sort of finance and policy pieces that are, that are important. And um, whenever you're, you're moving towards finance, it's critical to have the numbers uh, calculated in the background so we can figure out how much money needs to be allocated where. So models are absolutely essential. And similarly, when it comes to, um, 
to the development of policy. There's a lot of good stuff you can do looking at policy that does not require the use of, of models, but at the same time, you need to, not, in order to calibrate your policy sensibly and to think about what uh, kind of support mechanisms or institutions or regulations or other things are required, you kind of need to know what the energy system is in the future that you want. And in order to get a quantitative picture of what you want, these models are, are really important. So getting data and models and other things together is just absolutely critical. And um, it's, it's certainly the case that organizations like the IEA, the IAEA, IRENA, uh, GIZ, and a whole number of others, uh, you know, they, they, they know the importance uh, of this. But one of the things that's, and, and so it's an absolute privilege to be able to uh, to work together uh, with with colleagues from those organizations um, and, and a privilege to work under the IAEA uh, for this. But I think what's often not understood is that there's a really deep appreciation for the need to be able to do this analysis in country and to be able to drive it from country itself. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story, a uh, history, and uh, then go back to CCG and elements of CCG and, and what it is. So you know, I, I work right now at Imperial College and at Loughborough University and, uh, in the UK. I started off uh, as a student in the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and it was, um, you know, Nelson Mandela had come and gone as the president of South Africa, absolutely phenomenal president. And um, Thabo Mbeki was the, the new president. And one of the things that I really wanted to do together with some uh, friends is to develop an energy model for the country so we could map out the country's uh, uh, development. And, um, you know, we managed to ha get the ear of government. And so you know, we were doing this work for the president's office and we were connected with the utility and so on. And we wanted to get going. And there were a whole bunch of things that were just difficult to do. So first off is we understood that getting these numbers was just critical. We needed the numbers to release financing and to get policy straight and so on. So to do this modeling was just really, really important. But we ran into lots and lots of problems. So the first one was is that a lot of the software, if we wanted to get software, it cost an absolute fortune. So I remember being a student, uh, a master's student at uh, my university, and then going to my boss and uh, the funders and so on, saying, hey, we can get a copy of this software. Um, it was called Markel Times at the time, and it would set us back something like $20,000, which you know, it was not something that you could afford for a student work and it was uh, it was um, difficult to get a hold of it and that now if you want to get a hold of some of the cutting edge software it'll set you back you know a hundred thousand dollars in total and you might need to spend money on training on top of that and then it still doesn't come with all of the data so this is this is difficult so one it was really expensive we managed to scrape the funding together to get something up and up and running and then the next thing that was really difficult was to get a hold of some decent training. And uh, again, the the cost of training for us to find consultants who would do that and so on, you know, it was just a lot of money. It ended up, I think, being, again, somewhere ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, something, something around those those figures. And that was cheap. I mean, the typical cost would be closer to $100,000. And so that was expensive. And we worked really hard and we went and got the stuff and we did it. And then we found it really difficult to get a hold of data because a lot of the data was kept very, was either not just not accessible um, uh, because people weren't collecting it or it was held very close to the chest of a lot of industry or vested interest groups. And so it was like so difficult to put this, uh, this thing together. Anyway, we managed to get it all together and we got... Um, a model together. We spent a lot of effort getting the financing together. We taught ourselves how to use a tool, um, and um, we got to report into government. And it was really difficult from another point of view as well. And that was just that we found that there were very few people that we could talk to in the space. Certainly, almost no one in Africa 
uh, we managed to connect with a number of folk in Europe and other places that was that were doing this, this these these types of analysis, and we could work with them, and that was uh, that was handy and helpful. But this was difficult, and we got through basically because we knew that this was really important, and it's important for the, the development of the uh, the country. I then moved on and worked for the International Atomic Energy Agency. And one of the reasons why I moved to the IAEA is that they have a really good capacity building uh, program where they have a set of free tools and there's training and so on that uh, they provide to, to member states across the world, including most African uh, governments on request. And this is really great. And so we spend a lot of time uh, primarily working with, um, with government analysts and we train folk up and we get to use these tools together. Uh, and so on, and very important was to make sure that people were trained because it's only analysts in the country that really know what the country's issues are. So uh, it was that was that was important, and it was really good, and it was a privilege to work for the IAEA to do that. However, there were still some really difficult structural problems. One of them was just that it wasn't always easy to go and engage with. Uh, anybody outside of government. So there might be researchers in universities or other organizations that could do this stuff, but it was, it was difficult to engage with them. Another one, which was by far the biggest problem was that, you know, we'd work with really smart analysts. They would get skilled up and within a year or two, they would always get promoted out of the system. They would, uh, you know, either get poached by industry or it would be the case that they would move up the ranks because they had access to really important information and you know before they knew it they were working in the, the prime minister or the president's office and then the function inside of the ministry of energy to do the um, the analysis for the policy and finance and so on was just gone and you'd have to retrain uh people and so there was this massive problem with uh, knowledge management inside of uh, the, the the ministries and also difficulty trying to get move away from outsiders uh, being involved to make sure there was capacity in the country to produce the next generation of experts and so with that in mind it was a, yeah so then I then I moved off from with that in mind I moved away from the International Atomic Energy Agency and started to work in academia because it was the thought that we could address a lot of these uh, a lot of these problems, and the result of of that is um, after working a few years at KTH in Sweden, the result of that is this climate compatible growth program. I'll go into the constellation in a minute, but some of the things that we do, which are different, um, is that number one, we produce, uh, and we do this together with all of these partners and so on, so including the International Atomic Energy Agency, International Energy Agency, IRENA, and so on, is we produce open source, freely available tools and data and training, uh, as well as online teaching material. Okay? And this is aimed to do a number of things. So the problem that I had at the beginning, where everything was really expensive, and I was an analyst uh, back in South Africa, now somebody could pick up all of the, the, the data and the tools and the training and go through it all by themselves for free, which means that this can be set up in universities. Uh, universities can set up training programs and teaching programs around energy planning, but also really importantly, uh, going back to what happened next, working for the IAEA, you can also set up knowledge management programs inside of government too so as soon as you get new people coming on board it's possible to make sure that they uh, can get up to speed with how to collect energy data how to do demand projections how to do optimal investment strategies how to think about geospatial electrification and how to think about the financing so you know five really critical things that um, a government needs to be able to do so there's a start for all of that. And there's a capacity then to, as soon as you get somebody new on board, you can make it a requirement that they go through uh, that, that teaching and training, for example. So that's the first, one of the first things that, uh, that we've done uh, and, and so on. And then another thing we've done in partnership with organizations, uh, and it's led out of uh, the 
United Nations Economic Commission for Africa as well as to set up an energy modeling platform. And so once a year, there's a meeting in, um, uh, there's a meeting held at different places around Africa where there's intensive teaching and training to help people develop policy notes. So you can take some of what's learned in these models and get them just ready to slip into the policy process as well as academic papers. So if you're a university person, that's one of the things you want to get up and help and show folks how to set up those, those papers. Um, the energy modeling platform for Africa happens every year. It happens in different places for a reason. So uh, every year there's an African institution that you know, we, we discover uh, that is producing world-class uh, research uh, and analysis and so on. And so we try and hold the EMPA meeting uh, in those, uh, with those organizations to help build capacity. And this goes back to the university, it's just put, making sure that there are places and uh, experts that folk have access to in Africa and understanding some of the issues that people in Africa have, as well as elsewhere uh, in the world. So. The EMPA meeting has been held in Addis Ababa. We had one at my old university, University of Cape Town. The last one was held at the University of Mauritius, who are doing some really neat work. And I think the next one is likely to be held in uh, Namibia uh, with the government there, who are beginning to do a lot of very nice, nice stuff. So uh, climate compatible growth helps with developing some of these public good materials and you've been given access to all of those. There's this energy modeling platform meeting every year. Incidentally, we have a global uh, modeling meeting as well. Um, and if anybody wants to apply for that, you're welcome to apply for it. Uh, this year will be virtual, next year will be in person. And uh, again, we do that in partnership. In order to apply, you've got to finish one of the online courses and present that certificate as in, with your application. So there's limited time there, but if anybody really wants to do it, uh, please be in contact with uh, Naomi, it might be that you can slip in, uh, slip in this year. So CCG produces these things, global public goods, we try and help facilitate the development of communities and very keen on partnerships so that um, it's the case that countries are in the space to be completely empowered to be able to do this kind of analysis and really determine the direction uh, of its flow to help with making sure that things are coherent so the finance applications and policies are together um, to make sure that there's uh, transparency and robustness and so on and so and so that's that in a nutshell uh, I'll go back right now to describe CCG as a organization and uh, program so uh, this is norm normally you do all of this the other way around, but I think it's just useful to understand why and where all of this comes from. And just we're over the moon to be able to work with the International Energy Agency as well as uh, with yourselves. Um, so CCG is a is a program that comprised of a set of uh, universities. We're primarily funded by the the UK government but then open to be able to get co-funding to do other things and expand out like, like this, um, um, where we're being co-funded by the IEA to be able to do this work. And it is the case that uh, our members include the Imperial College, uh, Loughborough University, the Open University, uh, KTH in Sweden, uh, the um, University College London, Oxford, and Cambridge. So it's a really good group of, of universities and uh, we're just keen to, to partner and to learn and to figure out how to empower uh, our, our partners in, uh, in the countries that we're working in. We're set up so that there are um, a set of different work streams. So in the first work stream, we're very interested in uh, partnering with countries. We have, we have funds to partner with six countries at the moment and so uh, those are directly done and then where we can get extra funding then we partner with others so for example this is this is an example of that uh, then we have another work stream that looks at international partnerships and this can be relevant too so we'll do a lot of work with the development banks as well as with um, financiers like the or, or, you know, the green climate fund and so on and 
you know, this is this is really important because when we work with yourselves uh, to develop energy modeling uh, and tools and approaches, we want to make sure that what you produce, you can then go and take to uh, these development banks or others and get that funding. So one of the example, I'll come back to some of the example countries that we've worked with in a, in a minute. Uh, so second one is on international partnerships. Then we get into the nuts and bolts of uh, the sort of applied research work that we do. So the first one is on energy and transport modeling, and you've heard a lot about that now. And then the next one is we do systems of systems modeling. So we make sure that, so we'll model, for example, land use, water use, as well as energy. And this really helps some of the governments because uh, often we make policies, but we'll make them in silos. So maybe there's a biofuel policy. Uh, so you're using land to produce biofuel, but that might not fit with the agricultural policy where people are trying to produce more crops for export, say, for example. Um, and, and, and so on. And so, and then the last work stream is on finance and, um, and economics and so on. And so those are, that's the program. And some of the success stories include, for example, Costa Rica, where recently we worked with them to help set up the model. They run it completely themselves now, and they've applied for and gained uh, Inter-American Development Bank funding, World Bank funding, GCF funding, uh, and so on. So there's a really nice, clear example for how this could be done. I'll keep quiet there, because I think I've run out of time or gone slightly over, so I'll stop there. But, you know, Please feel free. So, any comments or questions to ask now? Also, you know, do be in touch with uh, Naomi, Carla, and and others. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, like Mark said, you know, feel free to email us or put anything in the chat right now or raise your hand if you've got any questions. Um, but yeah, again, thank you for having us here today, and thank you for listening. Um, and um, I'll pass it back to Darlene. Yep. Thank you very much, Naomi, and thank you very much, Mark. It was a pleasure. Uh, yeah, as Naomi anticipated, we can wait a uh, few minutes to see if there are questions. So I remind you, you can write in the Q&A box in the chat, or you can raise your hand so that you, we can give you the floor. Uh, in the meantime, I remind you tomorrow at the same time, we have uh, an additional uh, lecture with a partner from the academic world, which is Politecnico di Milano. Uh, then uh, Thursday, we will have uh, another lecture uh, focused on SDG 7, so on both access to clean cooking and electricity. And then next week, we will have solid biofuel modeling and the wrap up and quiz uh, session with which we will close this first phase of our training program. So I don't see any question, neither I see raised hands. So I would uh, thank again, Naomi, Mark, and all the team from the Imperial College and the CCG for this uh, very interesting lecture and see you for the last country actually which will be Uganda uh, in the next weeks. We will, we will uh, keep you posted. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.